Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started. My name is Judy Browse, and I'm the Executive Director of the North American Association for Environmental Education. And I want to welcome you to our monthly webinar series. And we're really excited today. We have a great lineup to talk about EE Works, which is all about demonstrating the power of environmental education and looking at the value and impact of our work. I first want to thank all our affiliate co-hosts who are helping us sponsor this webinar series. If you're not part of your local affiliate, please check out our website at NAA.org. Go to our affiliates and you can find your affiliate in your state or province or region, and I hope you can join. And just a few words about our monthly webinar series. Um, every month we try and hit topics that um, you have asked us to present on or that you're interested in. Um, and we're trying to bring new ideas and thinking to our work or trying to showcase amazing leaders and just trying to improve our overall practice and quality in our field and think a little bit outside the box. And our next webinar is on Tuesday, December 12th. And Curtis Ogden from the Interaction Institute for Social Change is going to be talking about new approaches to public engagement. So mark that on your calendars. So what we're going to do today is I'll give a very quick overview of Zoom, which is the platform we love, and then I will introduce our guest speakers and we'll get into the core content. We encourage you to ask questions throughout because if we don't get to your question, we'll make sure to answer it on EE Pro after this webinar. Um, we have a lot to cover, a lot of great um, thinking going on in the area of research and practice, and we couldn't have better guests. Um, and then we'll, if we have time, we'll have a few closing thoughts and talking about um, follow-up. So first of all, everybody is muted because we have so many people on the line, but you can talk to us anytime through the chat. And it's on your toolbar. If you see three dots, if you don't see the chat, you hit the three dots and the chat will come up. And you can either send a message to the whole group or just to the um, speakers by using the drop-down menu. So Kristen has been sending messages in the chat, welcoming everybody, and uh, take, go ahead and look at the chat and make sure you know how to use that because we really want you to engage with us. We know that webinars are tough and we can't talk to you all personally. And if you do have any technical problems, please email Kristen or Cy, our two wonderful um, team members. Um, Kristen is the manager of our webinar series, is fantastic, and Sai is our communication specialist, and they are helping to make sure that everything goes off without a hitch. And I'm going to introduce our speakers, even though I'm going to do a really um, very quick overview of EE Works before I turn it over to them. Let me introduce them um, now, and then you'll be able to um, get a chance to hear them in person in just a minute. So not in order of the pictures up there, I'm first gonna introduce Nicole Arduin, who I have had the pleasure of working with since our days at World Wildlife Fund. She is a leader in the field of EE. She's an assistant professor with a joint appointment in the Graduate School of Education and the Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford University. She's also Stanford's lead research on EE works, which we're talking about today in partnership with NAAE. Her research focuses on environmental behavior as influenced by environmental learning and motivated by place-based connections. And she's looking at the use of education, communications, and other social strategies in informal and community-based settings, including nature-based tourism programs to engage individuals and communities in deliberate, deliberative dialogue, environmental decision-making, and informed conservation behavior. Nicole also researches the effectiveness of a range of environmental education and social endeavors in achieving measurable and meaningful conservation results. So she conducts evaluations with informal organizations like museums, zoos, aquariums, parks, residential environmental ed programs, with an emphasis on using innovative, non-traditional metrics and adaptive management approaches. She's also interested in philanthropic support to the field of environmental education and emergent trends in the field. And she's the co-moderator of our research and evaluation discussion group with Alan Reed. So Nicole will be our first speaker. Um, and then Allison Bowers will be our second speaker. And Allison is a part-time graduate student at Virginia Tech pursuing a PhD in the educational research and evaluation program. Concurrently, she is also a researcher and consultant with a number of university faculty and environmental nonprofits. Her background and experience include working as a field-based environmental educator 
and at the national scale with nonprofit conservation and education organizations such as Project Learning Tree. Allison has also worked as a special education teacher. She has an education specialist degree in early childhood special education from George Washington, a master's in environmental education and communication from the University of Florida with Martha and a BA in psychology from the University of South Carolina. And last but not least, I'm also excited to introduce Martha Monroe, who I've known since we did workshops together in Tonga, Fiji, and Western Samoa for the US Peace Corps about a gazillion years ago. Martha is also a leader in the field and one of the people I rely on so much in my role at NAAE. Martha is an extension specialist in environmental education and a professor in the School of Forest Resources and Conservation at the University of Florida. And she provides support to a variety of EE programs and teaches communication, conservation behavior, environmental education program development courses, and human dimensions of wildland and urban interface issues. Um, Martha was also a past president of the North American Association for Environmental Education and has worked all over the world. And she's committed to using education to help move communities and nations toward conservation behavior and sustainable systems. So welcome to all of you. And we'll turn it over to you in just a minute, but I'm gonna give a very quick overview of EE Works, which is a project that many of you have heard us talk about and some of you have been involved with, which is truly looking at how do we demonstrate the impact of environmental education? When we were doing our strategic planning, we kept hearing that people wanted evidence that environmental ed works that everyone could use in grant proposals to convince your boss, to convince the government that we need to be funded. It's actually the data that's going to help us convince people who want that the nitty gritty of why environmental education works and to consolidate it and put it in one place. So that's what we're trying to do. For so long, many of us say, we know EE works because it just works. And in our gut, we know it works. So it's really important that we um, not only think about the stories and the passionate um, anecdotes, but also thinking about the evidence. And this project would not have been possible without so much support from so many of our partners. And this is just a small list of everybody that we have been working with. Um, coupled with Stanford and with Martha at the University of Florida and with USDA, US Forest Service, so many supporters. And again, it's, it's not that anecdotes and stories aren't good, of course they are wonderful, but it's also having the evidence for those people like the Office of Management and Budget who really wanna see numbers, they wanna see data, they wanna see evidence, and they wanna see stories, and it's combining all of that. We actually did a survey to our members as we are developing a new research database with the Children and Nature Network about what is most helpful to them. And what came out on top was syntheses of trying to look at the research across different areas and themes and then bringing together what worked and why it worked and helping to bring those learnings together. The second most useful were summaries and we can talk about that in a little bit. So EE Works is a project where we are looking at the evidence. What does the research say? What does the peer-reviewed research say? What does the gray literature say? What are the stories that are out there? That's the other piece of this. So we look at the research, we pull the stories together that are based on that research and that um, uh, peer-reviewed research and gray literature. And we talk about how do we communicate the results of this in ways that everybody can use for their own um, use and putting the communication tools together and posting that on the website as a part of this. And then the fourth area is professional development, how everybody can understand the research, understand what it's saying, and be able to use that as we think ahead. So those are the four different components. And with our advisory board, we have an amazing advisory group that has been advising us from the beginning. Um, we decided to pull out themes. We didn't look at environmental ed holistically across every avenue. We pulled out themes and looked at, for example, how does environmental education affect student outcomes? Um, Martha's gonna talk about climate change in education. Um, Nicole and Allison are gonna talk about conservation outcomes and uh, connecting children and nature. And then three new ones, youth development, civic engagement, and citizen science. And we really want this program to help us all communicate better about the benefits of environmental ed and all of us to really understand what works and for all of us to be able to better sell what we do to every audience that's out there that we're trying to reach. 
So our, the rest of this webinar is going to be looking at kind of where we are in the EE Works program. And we're going to start with a little poll that Kristen is going to put up on the screen so that you can tell us how you classify yourself. Do you think of yourself as a researcher, as a practitioner, or both? So you just click on that and then submit. We're almost there. And you'll get a chance to see the results in a momento. Okay, so you can see that 17% of you think you are a researcher and classify you as a researcher, 51% practitioners, and 32% of you think you are both, which is a really great mix, really great mix. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Nicole Ardwin, who's going to talk about the benefit of a doing a review, the types of reviews, and the process in conjunction with Allison. So Nicole, take it away and start your video. <laughs> Great. Um, I, well, I definitely unmuted myself, and let's see if I can start my video too. Great. There we go. Um, thank you so much, Judy, and I am delighted to be here with all of you today. And it's so interesting to see um, the mix of folks who are here on the phone. Um, I love thinking about the hybridity that occurs between those of us who think of ourselves as researchers, those of us who are practitioners, and those of us who are somewhere in between. Um, as we'll talk about more later on in, in the call today, um, our group has been doing a lot of work, particularly in collaboration with NAAAE, thinking about what it means to be a researcher, what it means to be a practitioner, and, and kind of what it means to be a little bit of both. And so I, I really enjoyed kind of reflecting on that, that area in between. Um, we've also been doing a lot of work thinking about what it means to do a research synthesis and what it means to do a review. Um, and I actually just am here to be on the, on the same slide with this koala because that's the best place to be, of course. <laughs> um, and talking a little bit about, um, and uh, you know, we're, we're going to give a little bit of an overview about what it means to do a research review, um, what the benefits are of doing research reviews, and then also kind of what some of the processes are. We're going to use our K-12 review as an example of that. I'm actually going to turn it over to Allison for this because Allison is focusing on this for her dissertation work and she's a researcher who's really digging into reviews overall and thinking about how we use this in many different fields. And again, applying this in the environmental education area, but recognizing that environmental education is one of many areas we're really interested in thinking about what it means to do a systematic review. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Judy. Um, as Nicole said, we just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about research reviews and that there's many, many different types of reviews. and this happens because there's different characteristics of reviews. They can vary in terms of subject, subject matter, um, what the focus is, the goal, the different perspective, the coverage, if you're trying to be exhaustive, if you're focusing on just a certain area, how you organize the review, and then who your audience is. And so when you think about all these different characteristics of the review you'd want to do, you would choose a different type of review. And as you can see on the slide, there's lots of different types. Um, I won't go over all these, but some of them you're probably familiar with, you know, annotated bibliography, academic review, narrative summary, theoretical reviews. Um, they can also vary in how they analyze the data if you're going to do a content analysis. Uh, many people are familiar with meta-analysis, which is um, using statistics to kind of aggregate findings and in using it that way. There's mixed methods reviews, uh, meta-synthesis, meta-ethnographies. And then with all these different type of reviews, a new type of review is emerging, which are overviews. And these are actually reviews of reviews, kind of meta reviews. So it gets very meta there. And of course, in EE, we have many different types of reviews have been done already. Um, some real good quality reviews kind of laid the groundwork as we started thinking about this. And so on the next slide, we'll see the type of review we're going to focus on. It's a systematic review. Um, Nicole and I were talking recently about how we're kind of seeing systematic review as a set of tools um, that you can use to do almost any kind of review. Many of us are familiar if you do research at all or you go into Google Scholar and you quickly type in your subject area and you do a very informal review. A systematic review differs in that in that you're trying to be very transparent, very explicit about the way you go about your review, your search, and your coding so that you can say 
you looked exhaustively, hopefully, and also without bias, that you weren't just focusing on, you know, two or three pieces of key evidence or two or three strands of evidence. Um, and so the kind of the green words you see on the slide, transparent, updatable, useful, focused, relevant, it's kind of what all systematic reviews, if you're using those tools, what you're aiming for. But if you think about it, it's really what research often aims for. And I think sometimes that gets lost that people see systematic reviews as reviews of research, but they're also a type of research. And so you kind of have to hold them to the same standards. And although there's many different ways to do reviews, um, uh, there is some agreement about some basic steps. And those are what you see here, uh, formulating the problem, searching the literature, gathering information from studies, evaluating the quality of the studies, analyzing and integrating the outcomes of studies, interpreting the evidence, and then finally presenting the results. So we thought what we would do is kind of share one way that we did a review using the K through 12 student outcomes review. Um, each review is kind of different. They each have their different personality based on, you know, the team, the question, the resources, the timing, and just how people think about it. And so for the K-12 through student outcomes, we started with kind of a pre-review of articles. We knew some really um, good articles that we liked and thought did a really good job of evaluating or researching K through 12 outcomes. And we explored those and said, how do we go about finding others like these? And that led us into identifying our search terms, refining our search criteria, actual conducting the searching, doing the vetting, which is where you read and review the papers in multiple rounds. Then you code the final set of papers, then we identified themes, and finally we wrote the review. And so on the next slide, we're going to focus in on one step that I get a lot of questions on, which is the vetting. It kind of seems this mysterious step. How did you start with, you know, over 2000 um, articles or studies and get down to 119? And the way that we kind of did this um, was we did the search and we downloaded all the citations to Zotero, which is a bibliographic management software program. We then began to read the abstracts and discuss each of the abstracts and decided whether to include exclude. We then went and read the articles of the ones we included. We dug even deeper and did an in-depth review of those and finally coded. And so although we started with 2000, over 2000 abstracts, um, we then read the whole articles of 426 of those records, got an in-depth review of 142 and ended up with our sample of 119. So once we had our sample, I'm actually gonna toss it back to Nicole to kind of talk about how, what we found. Great. Thank you, Allison. So as Allison mentioned, we, we did a systematic review um, of looking at K-12 environmental education programs. And our research questions on this, the, the guiding question on this was that we were really interested in thinking about what were the outcomes of interest in uh, environmental education programs with K-12 students, primarily in formal settings. And so what was driving this was that we were interested in understanding what were these programs intending to do? So what were, the, what were those programs really aiming toward? Um, and then within that, we were interested in understanding within the peer-reviewed literature, how is the peer-reviewed literature uh, suggesting that those programs were either meeting those outcomes and, and achieving those outcomes or, or not? Um, so we did, we followed the process that Allison has just described. And in the course of that, we arrived at these 119 articles that ended up being our, our sample that we, we use for our systematic review. Um, and actually, if you, would, if you would just go ahead, you're welcome to put up all the, great, thank you, all the bullet points here so that everyone can kind of see. We had this interesting um, sample that we were able to then go through and, and use as our, as our analytic uh, review. And we, we had a couple of elements of the sample that I'd just like to point out now in, in just our, our short time to focus on this. Um, one thing that we found that was really interesting, we used a 20 year time period for this. And one thing that we found quite interesting in this sample was that there was a huge increase in articles focusing on these K-12 outcomes within the second half of the sample. So you'll see that there is a, a real a rise. So 50% of the sample that we had was really within the last um, five years of that sample. So between 2009 and 2013. Um, so that suggests us, and we can spend more time on this during the question and answer period if that's of interest to you, but something that we took away from that is that there's just really been this increase in emphasis on, on out, an outcome orientation in the field of environmental education for a variety of reasons probably linked to policies in the United States, 
um, probably also linked to funding mechanisms in the US and, an, and a real emphasis on this kind of, again, this outcome orientation. Um, so that's something that, that warrants discussion and, and um, was something that we found kind of really fascinating within this sample. We also found that there was a huge diversity in the types of research designs and methods that people were using to study uh, environmental education overall, especially within this K-12 sector, um, and also the, the approaches that people were using to this. We will also say, though, because of this outcome orientation, we saw a lot of studies that were within the quasi-experimental realm. So a lot of people were really focusing, especially on quantitative data. And that's perhaps, again, not surprising because there's this outcome orientation to it. And again, we can speak more about this in the question and answer period if people are interested in that. So please do use your chat box to suggest um, places where you'd like to spend more time during that time. Nicole, a quick question. When did you begin this review? Grace asked that. Yes, so that the time period is 1994 to 2013. It's a, it's a 20 year review period. Um, and so, you know, as Allison described a little bit during, uh, during her process review there, one of the most important things to, during these reviews is to really think about what's your, what's the, what's the overall um, kind of the, the, the kind of area that you want to bound it. And I know that Martha will talk about this a bit more too when she talks about her climate review that, you know, one of the challenges with doing a review is that you can, oh, actually, if you could go back to the last slide, that would be great, thanks. Um, is, is to kind of bound not only your question, but also bound it in time, because that's a, that's a real challenge that reviews can really mushroom very quickly. And so putting a time cap on it, as well as putting a cap on your question is really critical. So thanks for asking that question, Judy. Um, we, so we did find that there were a lot of different kinds of programs. We found that there's a huge range of, of types of audiences, um, a lot of different kinds of outcomes. So we found in these 119 uh, articles that were actually 121 different types of outcomes being measured, which is really pretty interesting. A huge geographic distribution around the world, although within that, nearly half of these studies were done in the United States. And again, that's, an, that's kind of an interesting reflection, I think, on this outcome orientation, again, within the US context. Um, and then, of course, perhaps not surprisingly, there's kind of a you know, very quality in the type of research. And again, this, I think, relates to um, the type of funding that people have for the kind of research they're doing, the time frame that people have for the kind of research they're doing, and a variation between people focusing on evaluation and focusing on research as well. Um, and again, I'm happy to dig into any of these more during the question and answer period if there's any part of the sample that really catches someone's eye and that people would like to come back to in more detail. We want to just give you an overall suggestion of who was included in the sample um, when, we, when we kind of cast this net widely and then tighten it in around our, around our research questions. Okay, now I'd like to go to the next slide, please. Great. So we thought about what were the findings that we had. Again, Thinking about that question of what are the kinds of outcomes that people are measuring with this K-12 audience, primarily in formal set in formal settings, um, and then what are what are their what are they finding? Like how well are these programs able to actually meet those outcomes? Um, go ahead with the. So we found, um, not surprisingly, that the the kinds of focus that comes out of these programs are the traditional type of focus that we would see in the Tbilisi Declaration definition of environmental education. We see a strong focus on things like knowledge, dispositions, competencies, behaviors, and skills, um, both in the environmental realm as well as what we call these non-environmentally related outcomes. And um, so that was something that was actually really of interest to us. When we think about why do people engage in environmental education in formal settings. Um, a lot of times people do this because they are really interested in getting young people engaged in uh, environmental knowledge and, and outcomes, but also people are really interested in things like socio-emotional learning, civic engagement, um, in, in, in personal health outcomes, social outcomes. And so we did see that there was, there was this real emphasis um, in both of those elements in this sample. Um, I also would like to point out, as you can see here, that we had a hugely positive uh, skew in the sample. So we found that in most of these articles, people were really reporting positive outcomes. There are a couple of reasons for this. I, you know, I think a lot of it is that a lot of these programs really are very successful in achieving their knowledge gains, for example. Um, dispositions, so things around kind of attitudes and, and values coming out of these programs are really positive. Um, 
We also find uh, that in this sample, you know, of course, perhaps not surprisingly, a lot of journal articles are going to report, are more likely to report positive findings. And I think that Martha will talk about that a bit as well in her sample. Uh, but it is a really exciting opportunity to think about, going back to Judy's point, to think about, you know, where are the places that environmental education is really shining? And there are a lot of really great stories to report and a lot of really great data then to support those stories coming out of this review. Next, next slide, please. So this leads us to kind of think about what are some of the opportunities that we see ahead with thinking about this sample of 119 articles that again suggest incredibly positive findings from these articles. Um, you know, we, we do see that there's a couple of gaps in the field and as a researcher, uh, I see that as, as a positive opportunity. I see it as a positive opportunity for us to partner with our, with our colleagues who are in the field who are on the ground doing really fantastic work. We see that there is an opportunity for more longitudinal studies, and I, I'm positive that all of you who are out there are shaking your head and you know, in agreement in terms of this is not a surprise. Um, we also see that there's an opportunity for some more methodological rigor in terms of larger sample sizes, um, additional and different types of study, study designs. Uh, thank you. Uh, in different types of study designs, we see a lot of evaluations in the field and many times evaluations are really focused on specific programs rather than looking more theoretically across different programs. And so that's one of the recommendations we have coming out of this. And as I believe Allison mentioned earlier, you know, we are certainly not the first at all in our field to do reviews. There are many excellent reviews in the field of environmental education. And many of those other reviews are also calling for um, thinking broader, thinking across programs and not just doing evaluation, but also really thinking theoretically. Uh, and then one last place I'd like to emphasize is this idea that you know, we again find this really intense positive skew partially because I think a lot of programs are very successful and partially because just the way that the peer review literature operates we don't really reward people for for reporting null and negative findings um, and yet there is an opportunity to really share with each other where are we having challenges where could we learn from each other where could we have areas of growth and so we suggest that this is an opportunity for us to kind of to talk with each other about what challenges are arising and where we could really learn from each other's challenges. Great, next slide. So this is the article that we have published from this. Um, we are happy to, to share this with folks. It is in the Journal of Environmental Education. And then as part of this EE Works project, one of the exciting pieces of it is that NAAA has done a synthesis and has a whole suite of materials that are sharing these findings in a way that's really accessible for practitioners um, and that's really accessible for people who are working in the field and able to apply this in very different ways. And I'll turn it over to Judy, who may talk about some of the, the collateral materials here. Thanks, Nicole. Um, great overview. And it's been so great to work with you um, on this project and Allison. Um, but I just wanted to highlight very quickly that if you go to our webpage on EE Works, um, go to NAAE.org and look at EE Works. You can go to our research site or you can go directly to EE Works. There are a lot of products that we've worked together on that hopefully everybody can use. An executive summary of what Nicole and Allison found and her team that hopefully kind of summarizes what she just laid out. The article that she just mentioned, there's also a summary of the process they used. If somebody asks the question, well, what did they do and how did they do it, that's up there. Kristen has pulled together short anecdotes working with Allison that link to the research. So these are little snippets that are linked to the research and the peer-reviewed research that went into this um, overview. And then we are working on a communications piece that is it helps designed to help you talk to different audience. Like if you're going to talk to a school administrator, here are some of the key messages you might be able to say, or if you're going to talk to a decision maker or your boss or whatever, and we'll have different communication pieces with each of these different themes. And then we worked with Bill Finnegan, who put together an overall video on this first one on eWorks, and that again is on our website. So a lot of products from each one, and we hope that you can go visit that. This is what the web page looks like. And the article is in a PDF format, but you can also see it online. And it's talking about environmental knowledge is just the tip of the iceberg because it found a lot of other very positive benefits from the studies that they reviewed. So um, keep your questions coming and people are posting things. And I'm gonna turn it over to Martha Monroe to talk about the analysis that she did with her team on climate change education strategies. 
Thank you, Judy, and welcome, everybody. This is a fun thing to be involved with. Um, so, yes, if we could have the next slide. What Nicole explained, if you could imagine a logic model, and Nicole had environmental education programs as an, an output and was asking what are the outcomes of that endeavor. We turned it around the other way and said, what, when people learn about climate change, what is it that they're doing? So we were looking at the outputs instead of the outcomes because our outcome was a given. It was climate change is what they learn. So our question was, what constitutes an effective climate change program? We found about a thousand abstracts in the same process that Allison described. And we went through a decision tree to decide if they were going to be in or out and arrived at 49 papers. I will describe three categories which we've summarized from the six themes that we came up with. And just so you know, the decision tree is kind of essential to think about. We had these thousand abstracts. And the first question was, is this really appropriate for us to use? Is it not a dissertation, not a book review, a paper in English, and not doubles? Because sometimes you get two of the same thing. So how many single appropriate papers are we looking at? We read all the abstracts and said, does it really focus on climate change education? And did they assess or measure how well the intervention worked? Because we wanted them to prove that what they did worked. And so right there, it took out almost 800 of the 1,000 abstracts. We were wanted the outcomes that were really reported in, so that we could say, this is what works. That took us down to 66. We read those 66 papers and then discussed again, is this appropriate? Because sometimes the abstract gives you a different idea than the whole paper. So 17 got pulled out at that point, which is how we got down to 49 papers. And the next slide. So here's what we heard. About half of the papers were from the United States, about half from 12 other countries in, in the world. Most of the papers were talking about education in schools or universities. 26 out of 28 were in classrooms. Most of those middle and high school, a few elementary, but elementary was not typical. There were also out of school programs. There were also adult education programs. Even one was an online game. There were some teacher training activities as well. The, the most unusual one from, based on what you can see from this description, the most unusual we read had to do with a festival where people were um, going through an exhibit on climate change. So most of the others were regular, what we think of classroom education. And they all described success. They all helped increase knowledge or attitudes or skills or behavior. We didn't subdivide them into, okay, these are the ones that change behavior, so how did we do that? We left them all in one big group of 49 papers and then looked for the themes across those 49. The next slide. Thank you. So of the three big themes, two of them are probably familiar to all of you because it's what we know about good environmental education. And one I would say is even good science education. If you want to teach about climate change, you should be using good education. It should be relevant, meaningful, engaging, experiential, help people talk to each other. And because it's climate change, we also found a theme of engaging with scientists, collecting data, analyzing data, some level of that science. And so we already know that. We don't really have to spend much more time talk, thinking about that. The trick is that it's not so easy to make climate change relevant, meaningful, and engaging because it's so big and nebulous and far away and in the future. But in the 49 papers that we read, we found evidence that people were doing exactly that, mostly because they were focused on the risk that local people were feeling because of climate. What, how is climate affecting them? So it might be affecting ecosystems, invasive exotics, sea level rise. It was something to make it relevant and meaningful in that local area. They weren't all in the Arctic. In fact, only one was thinking about the Arctic and they were doing GIS so that they were measuring from satellites. Secondly, there was another theme where these papers were referencing 
projects that learners were engaged in. Those projects might have been in the classroom where they were assigned to do a public service announcement, or they might have been in the community where they were collecting data, um, educating community residents, or engaged in local adaptations for climate change. And again, I think environmental educators know that. That's what we want to have educators do. That's where you learn skills, that's where you, you help critique your abilities, you gain efficacy for making change. We know that that's good. But our third category is on the next slide. Thanks. And this might be a little different for some of us. Or at least I think it might help push environmental educators into a slightly new air arena. And that is, we found a theme where these projects were helping learners think about what they know, why they know it, how they came to know that, where does this information come from. They were, they were thinking about their thinking and they were able to articulate what was going inside their heads. These were the activities, these were the programs where educators were helping students wrestle with misconceptions around climate change. They were definitely using a constructivist approach to how do you know that? What evidence do you see there? How do you explain the difference between this chart and this chart? Talk about what's going on here. And I think in the context of climate change, that really opens the door to looking at worldviews and why it is that people have such different perceptions about climate change. If we just stick to the science, we don't get to this point. And, and I think that in, environmental educators are more accustomed to having value-laced issues and doing exactly this. Um, if it's who gets the kidney or where do we put the landfill, we're accustomed to saying, okay, stakeholders have different perceptions and let's explore that. And this piece of the review is saying, Maybe that's okay to do in science education too, which is a little different for us, or at least for me. So taking everything that we've just mentioned and all the things that we looked at, if we were going to say, oh, here's a good climate change education program, it would be something that had some or all of these characteristics. Focus on the local with meaningful, relevant context. Use activities that are engaging and experiential because we know that's how people learn collect or analyze somebody else's data, maybe go on a field trip or interview or have some sort of interaction with scientists, which also makes it local and relevant if they're studying local area. A school project, either in the school or in the community to share information or adapt changes, demonstrate change, and then reflect on and discuss what they know and how they know it and what it means to know that and why other people think differently. So, we have a paper that has come out with these findings, and you can read it in the Environmental Education Research Journal. Just like the previous one, NAAE has a website for this material, and we'll be developing more of the activity, um, all the things that came out of the last one will come out of this too. Right now, there's the list of the 49 papers that we, um, that we used, and you can read their abstracts and find out more about them. Thanks. Martha, I will mute myself and turn it over to the next person. No, Martha, don't mute yourself yet. We have um, two questions that both deal with the same thing. And Nicole and Allison, feel free to jump in here. Um, Susan asked if any of the studies examine the long-term impacts on EE. And if children receive EE in schools, does it impact their lives later? And Caleb asked something similar, the ratio of research periods and long-term outcomes. Were there any that were really well designed or especially rigorous, um, looking at that long-term outcome piece. And I just don't know if any of you want to address that. So two, looking at kind of the, the longer term. So one thing I can mention is that all of the papers came from peer-reviewed research journals, which means the authors are writing, they're answering research questions. They're not answering our question. They're not saying this is what makes climate change effective. They're also not describing the program by and large. They are answering a research question in the context of educating about climate change. So none of the papers that I can remember right now answered specifically this question about long-term impacts, in part because you know, they're trying to get a paper out. There's a short-term window there. Um, 
So part of it is just the context of how we were searching made it unlikely that we would be able to answer that question. But I'll keep thinking about that as Allison and Nicole talk. And if I think of anything, I'll put it on the chat room. Thanks, Martha. And Nicole, I'm gonna turn it back over to you on the conservation outcomes review and we'll um, stop at the end again and see if anybody has any questions. Great, thank you. And actually, uh, you know, I might I might turn to Allison for just a second because we do, um, yeah, I think our, our, as mentioned, our search criteria was a little bit different than, um, than Martha's. And so we did have a couple of papers in our sample that did uh, have, have slightly longer term follow-up. Although, as I mentioned, you know, certainly I think the longitudinal area is one where we could do a lot more work. But Allison has a couple examples of papers that I think would address that question. I do. So, so in our article, um, on one of the tables we actually included, we focused in on, we identified 34 in our sample of 119 that had some kind of delayed assessment um, follow-up. And that length of assessment kind of varied. We had less than a month um, to one to six months. Um, most of the follow-up was done one to six months after the program. 26 of the studies um, looked at it one to six months and two studies actually went as far as to looking to two to three years is as far as um, we saw in terms of length. Um, and there, there were a couple of them um, that um, I can follow up um, and send the list of them. Um, one of them I remember was a, a study in France with batteries and our recycling of batteries and they followed up. Um, and I remember it being a pretty solid design. And then we had one that Nicole actually did was in the uh, follow up as well. Um, and I think that was a six month, although Nicole probably knows the details much more than I do. Great, thank you. And those are and those are great questions. Um, and yeah, we, we're happy to send out. And actually, I think you know, after this webinar, we will send out um, kind of a, a grouping of resources as well. Um, so we are happy to send out the resources that we have. As Allison mentioned, and, and similar to Martha, we have um, an online resource that lists all the studies that were in our paper. And so we can send a link to that as well, um, in, in addition to any additional articles. Um, so great questions. Uh, so I'd like to move on and talk about the next two reviews that we are in the thick of things with these two. And so I'll just mention these briefly, um, both in the interest of the fact that we're in the midst of them and also in the interest of time because they have a number of other things to cover. Um, so the two that, that Allison and I and, and teams of other researchers are working on right now is that we're, we're working on one right now that's looking at um, conservation. And so the link between environmental education as a strategy and conservation outcomes. This is one that's really near and dear to my heart because what brought me to the field of environmental education was really a, a passion for um, environmental conservation. And as Judy mentioned at the beginning, she and I first met working at World Wildlife Fund together. And so this is the kind of question that you see on the, you'll see on the screen, the guiding research question here. This is the kind of question that Judy and I um, get all the time from our colleagues in conservation. And, and so we're, people are always asking, how does environmental education actually con contribute to improving the bottom line of uh, environmental conservation? Or our colleagues who work at places like US EPA or Fish and Wildlife Service or Forest Service, they're always getting questions around what does this actually mean for environmental quality? Um, and so that's a, that's a fantastic question. It's one that you know can be tricky to answer because there's so many different ways of parsing that question and thinking about um, what do you actually mean by an environmental quality outcome or what do you actually mean by a conservation outcome. And so as going back to thinking about how Allison was defining that question at the beginning and how we do these reviews, we spent a lot of time thinking about what do we actually mean? How do we operationalize these terms? We ended up using the Rockstrom et al. Um, definition around their, their highly cited article uh, around planetary boundaries, where they talk about these kind of various planetary boundaries um, that, are, that are kind of actually nice buckets that, that are pretty encompassing of various different ways of thinking about the challenges that are facing our planet currently. And we use those then in combination with various terms for environmental education. So environmental education, um, education for the environment, uh, education for sustainability, sustainability education. So by kind of combining all these different terms, we're then able to look at how those combine with things like um, biodiversity conservation with, um, you know, with water quality, with, um, with air quality, with all these kind of different challenges as defined in the Rockstrom framework. Um, as we're looking at how these then address conservation and environmental quality outcomes, we're seeing a couple of different ways that that happens. Um, and these three bullets here just give you some examples of that. You know, you might see these as really coming out with these direct 
outcomes on environmental quality. Um, so really it's directly improving air quality or directly improving water quality. Um, and really you'll, you'll see that direct improvement. But as you can imagine, that's, that's probably, it's, we, we kind of joke, we call it kind of like the holy grail. That's kind of like the hardest place to get to because to make that direct link is, is, can, can be a challenge um, for a number of reasons. We also are then looking at um, notions of environmental behavior related to some of these environmental education programs. So what are, the, what are these studies reporting with regard to observable behaviors um, with regard to in, in programs, people go home and then take some kind of direct and observable behavior that may be, say, reported through a power bill or a water bill. Um, so it's something that's got a tangible outcome that we can then see once people return home. We also then are looking at articles that are giving us a self-report, which is kind of like the next level down. So people give us a self-report in it's reported in that article. And then kind of our, our last bucket is that we're looking at these, what we're calling you know, the behavioral antecedents. So things like um, people come out of a program with this kind of, this kind of suite of things like knowledge, attitudes, skills related to the program um, that are then also relating to these environmental conservation or environmental quality outcomes. Um, so again, that's, it's all within this continuum, um, some of which are really hard and direct related to conservation and environmental quality, and some of which are further away from that direct environmental quality outcome. Um, so we are in the midst of working on this, on this now, and um, we hope to have this review done within the next couple of months. So we've, we've been kind of trolling through these articles and going through the process that's been described. Uh, I will pass it on to Allison, who's going to talk about the other one that we're working on. Oh, actually, no, I won't. I'll just <laughs> show you this. This is another slide that just kind of talks about everything I've just mentioned here. And now I'll pass it on to Allison, who will talk about the other one that we're working on, which has also been a lot of fun. Thanks, Nicole. Yes, this is, has been exciting, I think, because this is the Early Childhood and Environmental Education Review. Um, exciting because early childhood is getting kind of its moment in the sun, I think, in education and in policy as people recognize the value in working with and reaching out to, to our youngest uh, children. And the guiding questions with this one are what outcomes are being measured in early childhood environmental education? Um, we had done the K through 12, and this is kind of a nice follow up to that one to figure out are people doing, are they focusing on different outcomes with a younger audience, or is it the same that we saw before in terms of your traditional kind of Tbilisi ones? And what findings are associated with those outcomes? So, again, this was kind of to get at the proof that, hey, early childhood environment or education um, is, is working um, when we're looking at these different kinds of outcomes. And so on the next slide, it kind of talks about the process. Again, we're using the systematic review process. Uh, this one's a little different. Before, we had stuck just to academic databases, um, but we knew ahead of time that um, at least two journals uh, were not um, well indexed yet in the academic databases, so we did some manual hand searching of table of contents of select journals. And this one we actually did not limit to peer reviewed research. Um, we had kind of heard and through the grapevine that there was some great, great literature out there in the early childhood, so we didn't limit it to the peer review one. Um, we did find it is um, tough to search the uh, great literature in environmental education. There's not a clearinghouse that that you know, um, has all the different gray literature reports and everything there. So it was a challenge. Um, and kind of because we knew the age of the participant is, is young, that the focus of the research in terms of methods, in terms of outcomes, that's, that is, we think it's going to be somewhat different. And that's, that's one of the things we're exploring. Uh, so we're very excited about this one, um, have gone through the process and are in the process of writing up everything and uh, looking forward to sharing some results very soon. So I will throw it, um, Judy, I don't know if it's going back to you or Nicole. Yes, but I just want to thank you both. We are so excited about conservation and early childhood and that eventually um, with climate change, we will have four of these reviews done and eventually um, we will do these new themes. We've got some funding to look at youth development, civic engagement, and citizen science that we're really excited about. And again, we have not framed these yet in terms of the questions we're going to ask. But if you can imagine at the end of all of this in the next couple of years that we would be able to pull together, here are some of the, the value and impact of environmental ed more broadly. We've done it theme by theme, which will really be helpful to certain people in certain areas. Um, and then we also have funding for one additional theme. And the themes are so interesting because everybody has such different ideas about what would be most important to them. And we've tried to gather all the um, ideas from our different supporters, funders, colleagues, practitioners, researchers, 
These are some of the other themes that we're looking at, diversity, environmental justice, health and wellness, green schools, um, professional development, because we didn't really, we talked a little bit about that in K through 12, overall environmental literacy and residential environmental ed. And there were many more in addition to that. So if anybody has ideas, love to hear your thoughts on what themes might make sense. And hopefully we will have this um, collection that all of us will be able to use in our work and to be able to learn also not only what is working, but also where the gaps are as Nicole and Martha and Allison have mentioned. And then we're also doing some other things, um, thinking about how to link research and practice. So EE Works is one important one and really looking at it's not just how research informs practice, but how practice in informs research, as Nicole has said many times, um, and how do we make the research more accessible. And one thing we are doing that I wanted to mention is we will be launching a global research database. We have, we have research on our site right now, and we have partnered with the Children in Nature Network, thanks to um, wonderful support from the Pisces Foundation, which has really been so transformative in the field of EE of looking at six ways that they can help support systemic change in the field. And creating this global research database, again, going back to that survey I talked about and what people are looking for. Number one, they're looking for syntheses. Number two, they're looking for summaries. They're also looking for original articles. We want to be able to provide a place where they can come and find what they're looking for to help in whatever way, whether you're a practitioner or a researcher or both. So we're hoping to launch phase one of this at the end of January, um, and we'll have more about that in the future. And another thing that we're doing as part of EE360, which is the National Educator Training Grant, a partnership between um, uh, actually a cooperative agreement between NAAE and EPA with a number of amazing partners, including Stanford and working with uh, Nicole. And I wanted Nicole to just talk about the piece that she's doing with her colleagues on research and practice. Great. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, this is, a, I, and I, um, I want to be sensitive to time because I can see there's lots of terrific questions popping up here. But I, I mentioned briefly at the beginning that, um, that our work on this initiative has dovetailed really nicely with the, with the EE Works initiative, has dovetailed really nicely with some of the other efforts that we've been undertaking that has caused me to reflect even more deeply on kind of my role as, you know, you're seeing me here as my, in my role as a researcher, but I also feel really um, passionately about the work that I, that I do as a practitioner. I'm an educator here uh, in my role as a university professor. I also work with my daughter's Girl Scout troop and as a, as a leader and do education there. I um, do a lot of community-based education and I have been working um, in this role with, with Judy's team and our, our team here has in kind of really thinking about what are these, what are these connections between research and practice. And, and we've been doing workshops here um, using the design thinking process to try to think about getting beyond kind of our, I think we often use as a shorthand term, we think that there, the barriers are, are tools that people don't have tools to better connect research and practice, or people don't have time to connect practice and research, or people maybe don't have the resources for it, all of which are all of which can be true. But we're also trying to dig in more deeply about what are some of the other barriers and what are some of the other facilitators for connecting those. And it's been a really exciting process and really actually emotional and interesting process to kind of see what are some of the ways that we can better facilitate these connections. Um, and also, as Judy mentioned, not only, you know, we often put research first and then say practice, but also, you know, foregrounding practice as well, recognizing that especially in the field of environmental education, but also in so many other fields like public health and international development and um, diversity, equity and inclusion, there are so many places where, where practice, I think, is, real, is really ahead of research and recognizing that um, that's, a, that's a place where we really need to understand the kind of intricate connection between both of these areas. Um, so I, I would like to invite you to, to think about, you know, as we offer additional workshops around this, I would love to invite many of you to join us in this, in this journey, um, thinking about how we can really use practice to inform our research and also how we can use research to inform our practice and recognizing this critical partnership. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I think it's like quite amazing that we were able to, I think, stay on time a bit. And we have just um, a few minutes here for any questions. The one I'm seeing is several people have mentioned environmental justice, environmental ethics, of uh, possible themes. And I think we'll just go right to any closing thoughts that the three of you have before we close this out. 
And again, I encourage you to write any additional questions you have in the chat box and we will answer them on EE Pro in the research and evaluation um, discussion group. But Martha, Nicole, Allison, any thoughts about the future, what you're learning, any closing thoughts before we go into the wrap up? Well, let's not all jump in there together. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Martha. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I would caution us a little bit about how we lean on these systematic reviews to be the answer to everything we need to know. Because um, we may not be framing the question to answer all of the practitioner, all of all the questions that need to be answered, number one. And I also think that we, we only can use in the reviews the things that have been written, peer review or reports or gray literature or whatever it is, we're synthesizing what's out there. So we may run into the edge of what's out there and that speaks to what else we need to be doing, what other kinds of dimensions and questions we ought to be asking as practitioners and researchers to keep moving the field forward. And that's a good outcome to have from a systematic review. What's not there? What should we be doing? Yep. Thanks, Martha. And Nicole? Yeah, that, I, I love that point, Martha. Um, and that actually leads me to something I was thinking as I was looking at all these terrific questions that are coming up, especially the strong interest in environmental ethics and environmental justice, which I think is such a really critical um, piece of the field of environmental ed. I actually just, to, to join you all, I just left my lab group meeting where that was actually the topic of discussion today. Um, and you know, I, it makes me think about that. You know, that's one particular area where environmental education. I know there's so many people who are committed to that area and, and really interested in it. And yet, I think you know, we've we've got kind of a a gap. Um, I also see this question around ethics and philosophy. You know, I, I think that there are areas where when we use search terms, you know, only use search terms like environmental education and some of these other areas, we're, we're kind of shutting out other fields. Um, and yet I think that we have the opportunity to perhaps look in other fields and, and bring in from other fields. Um, so for example, like with some of these systematic reviews, if we, if we are more inclusive in our search terms, we may have the benefit of learning from other, other fields. Um, I know that we've talked in some other webinars we've done with NAAAE about the beauty of the field of environmental education is that it's interdisciplinary, it's multidisciplinary, it's transdisciplinary. Um, so it's actually not a field, it's actually ma it's many fields. And I think we would do well to remember that when we do these reviews that we really are pulling from many different areas, especially in some of these um, places where we, where we might have some, some kind of, uh, Ms. Allen Reed would say some of these blind spots and bald spots, right? Like there's some, some blind spots that we have and we can really fill those in with other fields that have perhaps done a better job. Thanks, Nicole. And Allison, any last words? I do. I think I just want to echo what uh, Nicola Morth was saying. Uh, re really, I think the value of a plurality of reviews, that um, reviews, they differ. We could have the same question and go the same methods. And just depending on who's on your team, it, it really does. We, we like to think it's uh, more objective than it probably actually is. And so I just echo a call for you know more research and more reviews. I think it's clear that all the research out there, we need more and more synthesis. And um, I think the more people we get involved, the better. Thank you all so much. Um, we couldn't have a better crew on today. Um, so much interesting um, thinking around this. And um, I know we didn't get to everybody's questions, including um, the Pamela, your question about NAAE connected to um, farm to table and food systems education. And we'll take a look at all of these and try and answer them again on EE Pro. If you wanna know more about EE Works, um, please go to NAAE.org and look at um, our work and go down to programs and see EE Works, or you can also go to our research um, page. And there's a lot of information that we talked about. And again, we'll continue the discussion on the research and evaluation group on EE Pro. You can also um, keep on learning about new webinars, not just our webinars, but you can find out about our webinars. Kristen is amazing at advertising what's coming up next. And please weigh in on what you think um, would be a good topic um, for the future. You can go to EE Pro here, look at learning site, look at webinars and find out what else is going on. Um, and again, December 12th is the last webinar of the year. Hard to believe we're getting to the end of the year already. And we would love to um, 
have you take um, five minutes to take our webinar survey. And I think Sai will probably click that into the chat box so that you can just click on that and be able to take the survey. Um, some of you also asked about, is this going to be um, recorded? And yes, it's recorded and it will be posted on EPRO. So you can listen to it again, or you can send it to your colleagues. Um, I cannot thank you enough, Nicole and Allison and Martha, for all your insights, all the hard work on this. It is very time consuming and also very kind of inspirational to hear what people are finding and doing in the research and how we can use this information, even with the caveat from Martha, that we can't put all our eggs in this basket, but it's a basket that has a lot of information that I think all of us can use. So thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you next month. And please give us feedback on what we should be doing, other webinars, other insights. Thank you all so much for um, joining us today. Okay, you guys. <laughs>